Spoilers for all Xenoblade games. Ever since Xenoblade X was released, people have come up with theories as to what its link is to the rest of the Xenoblade series. And with Xenoblade 2's release in 2017, the question continues to linger. Despite some thinking X simply isn't connected at all, I'm going to put forth my theory as to how these seemingly different universes may in fact be connected. Although Xenoblade X is often said to have the weakest story out of the Xeno games, co-director for Xenoblade Ko Kojima is quoted as saying, Come to think of it, Takahashi wrote a lot. I've worked with Takahashi for a long time, but this was the first time I've seen him write so much for a game's plot. It was as if he was writing a novel. This sort of statement makes you wonder where all this hidden story is. Most major story beats may be part of the final game, and some may be in side quests, but from the sounds of it, there may be more. This isn't the first case of hidden story details. The same is true for the original Xenoblade. This can be discovered in an Iwata Ask interview featuring Tetsuya Takahashi and others involved in the development of Xenoblade. As the writing of the scenario, for Xenoblade 1 approached its final stages, Yuri Hattori from Nintendo's software planning and development department was brought in to provide an objective overview on the plot of the game. One key detail is what she said about the game's ending. Hattori explained that she couldn't understand it. Takahashi further explains her feedback. There were things that seemed perfectly clear to us, but which were actually tricky to understand for players who didn't have previous knowledge. The key word there is previous knowledge, the key to the ending of Xenoblade 1. Many wonder why Xenoblade 2's was so fleshed out in comparison to the original. The ending in Xenoblade 2 is in fact what was originally supposed to be shown. I believe this previous knowledge was in fact knowledge players were supposed to have from Xenosaga, such as the Zohar. Due to Yuri Hattori's feedback, the ending was simplified and elements that were only brought in at the end of the game were removed to avoid confusing the player. In conclusion, it has been Takahashi's plan from the start to include the Zohar, or the Conduit, that created the world of Xenoblade 1, and it's entirely possible that the immense script behind Xenoblade X also contains unknown and hidden details that could explain its connection to the rest of Xenoblade. In a VG247 interview with Tetsuya Takahashi, they ask him a question about the change of Alvis's key to reference Xenoblade 2, and how he may be trying to further connect these universes. Takahashi clearly states, From the beginning, each entry in the Xenoblade Chronicles series has depicted a single episode within the flow of a larger time and space. It is from these details that I've tried my own way of connecting X to the other games, as it truly seems as though it is. It's merely a question of figuring out how Takahashi has done so, and to present my theory, I've created this diagram to explain it. This theory will encompass the activation of the Conduit by Klaus, where most of humanity was transported to through the opening of the Conduit, what happened to the Saviorites, what Elma may be, who the Cimmerians are, and the phenomenon that brought people to the mysterious planet of Mira. As you can see, there are two versions of this timeline at the moment. It reflects the two ways in which Xenoblade may be at the moment. Either Shulk created a whole new universe, completely separate from 2 and X, or Alvis in fact transported Shulk's world back to the original timeline with Rex and Klaus's new world. Whichever ending you subscribe to, it ultimately makes no difference in my theory. My theory will work in both cases. Now, let's begin. In 2001, the Conduit is discovered in Africa. It is studied by the unified government by the organization Awidas. A rebel faction emerges, a religious group known as the Saviorites. They wish to take back the Conduit, believing it rightfully belongs to them. A great battle ensues, in which much of the Earth is ravaged and destroyed. Hoping that it may take them to somewhere better, Klaus ignores the orders of the Beanstalk Director and activates the Conduit. The power of the Conduit, the power of the Divine Entity, envelops the entire planet. Many people and many things are taken in distant dimensions. This is where the story splits into three parts. 
One part is the story of Xenoblade 2, where half of Klaus is left behind on the original Earth in its ruins. He repents for his sin by vowing to recreate life. The second part is Xenoblade 1. Antas, Galea, and the second half of Klaus are transported into a newly birthed universe, made specifically so that they may exist. And the third and final part, the story of Xenoblade Chronicles X. The remaining parts of humanity, including many of the Saviorite faction and some Nopon, are also transported through the conduit to a new dimension. They find themselves on a strange and exotic planet. With them, may have also transported some of their advanced human technology, enough for them to sustain themselves and survive. Eventually, they rebuild to create a great civilization with the ex-Saviorites as humanity's new leaders. They rename themselves as the Nation of Samar and they set a new goal for humanity, to set out into the cosmos and search for Earth. Search for their lost holy land. To retrieve what they believed was rightfully theirs, the conduit. To search for lost Jerusalem. The powerful Samarians travel out into the universe on their quest, the humans of the Samarian Federation seem to begin to dwindle in numbers, perhaps due to being attacked or chased by something, possibly the ghosts. Nevertheless, the remaining few of humanity finally rediscover Earth and hide there from the rest of the universe. Close to 10,000 years have now passed. It's the mid-2020s AD. Elma arrives on Earth and warns the Coalition government that two alien races will soon come to Earth to wage war against each other, destroying Earth in the process. And so, with technology and knowledge shared from Elma to humanity, they create Skells and the Ark ships to escape from Earth and find a new world. Thirty or so years have passed, and in 2054 AD, Elma helps the White Whale escape Earth's destruction by the hands of the Ghost and Ganglion. However, an intersection between all three universes approaches once more. Xenoblade X, year 2054 AD. Xenoblade 2, year 4058 AM. Xenoblade 1, year 2 ABSV. Shulk and his companions battle Zanza, Rex and his friends battle Malos, and Elma helps humanity escape in the White Whale. Shulk kills Zanza, his wish to Alvis is a world with no gods. As per his command, Alvis causes the conduit to fade away to an unknown location. Rex defeats Malos, but with the disappearance of the conduit, power drains from Elysium and the orbital station begins to crumble. And in the confrontation between the Ganglion and the Ghosts, the Earth is seemingly destroyed in a huge explosion, although the Ganglion don't see the end of this fight. In fact, they are engulfed by a white light and mysteriously transported directly to the planet Mira. If the Great One or the Samar Federation homeland were here, don't you think we would have found something by now? Hmm. It's one thing to engage the enemy all the way out near that forsaken chunk of rock they call Earth. But then to be swallowed up by that strange light and dumped off here in this primordial hellhole, are we cursed? And trapped with humans of all things. It's like some sick joke. If someone told me this was death, I'd believe them. All the more reason to persist. We must retrieve it if we ever hope to escape the confines of this phenomenon. I believe that somehow, the planet Mira is connected to the Conduit, as many different species give the same explanation as to their arrival on the planet. The White Whale inexplicably found Mira on its two-year journey. The Manon described their nav systems as failing, then all of a sudden, finding themselves on Mira. All of these cases bear an uncanny resemblance to the matter shifts caused by the Conduit. As for the Napon, they explain that they're native to Mira, and this is true. The Napon had arrived on Mira 10,000 years ago along with the original humans when they were transported via the Conduit to Mira. And lastly, just under a year into the White Whale's travels away from Earth, meanwhile in Xenoblade 1's new world, there is trouble brewing. The people in Alchemoth are driven out by a mysterious new creature, the Fog King, having emerged from a mysterious rift. 
This rift is also capable of possessing animals, giving them a peculiar black and orange aura. The people in Alchemoth lose the capital and are forced to live on the Bionis shoulder. The events of Future Connected take place a few months after this, and by the end, the Telethia save their world by bombarding the rift and closing it, allowing Melia to finally kill the Fog King. However, in the world of Xenoblade X on Mira, Elma and the party come across creatures they call the Tainted, seemingly just normal species you can find on Mira, but possessed by a strange black and purple aura, causing them to attack anything in sight. But when almost facing certain death, they're rescued by none other than a Telethia. In Noctilum alone, there not only resides these possessed animals, but also a single Telethia to oversee them. These possessed creatures are found nowhere else on Mira, as the Telethia makes sure to contain the anomaly. It can only be explained that it seems a rift had appeared above Noctilum and the fog creatures had left their mark on the creatures of Mira. But due to the events of Future Connected, a Telethia managed to navigate through the rift and arrive at Mira. Nevertheless, the mere existence of the Telethia is a solid link between Xenoblade X and 1, for a Telethia is a cell of Zanza. It has no other origin. And with that, we're up to date with the Xenoblade timeline. In conjunction with this overall timeline theory, there are also theories pertaining to other unexplained things in Xenoblade X. Who is Elma? It's most likely she's closely related to the Samarians, maybe even the ancient Samarians, the ex-Saviorites. She simply describes herself as a Xenoform, but she may have been an engineered tool related in some way to the Conduit, the Saviorites, and Aoidas. What about Vita and the Grey One? It's said that the Vita lacks a final component. The final component could be the Conduit, similar to how Omega from Xenosaga required the Zohar as a power source. But I'm not detecting any known materials or components for the purple frame part. In fact, I can't even find a power source. According to Lin, she could not find an onboard power source for the Vita. This draws similarities to the other mechs, such as the Gears, ESs, and the Artifices. The Artifices introduced in Xenoblade 2 do not have an onboard power source, but instead have a slave generator. This slave generator harnesses its power directly from the conduit. One other detail is how the Ganglion mentioned how the Vita can only be fully operated by the Great One. This could be similar to how Abel was the pilot of Omega Res Novi, or even how only an Aegis could fully operate a Siren. Though again, this also involves the Great One being linked to the divine entity behind the conduit. Not only that, but both these explanations link the creation of the Vita to the Samarians and the Saviorites in their quest to retrieve the conduit. All in all, this is my attempt at a theory to connect all of the Xenoblade games. Let me know what you think. Perhaps you can come up with a way of creating a one-world interpretation. Nevertheless, we will eventually know the full story of Xenoblade in time.